Hey, welcome back to our extended cuts for the weekend series, What You Need to Know to Know What You Need to Know. We've been talking about the Bible, and so here it is, all 66 books of the Bible. And we've arranged them in a way that helps you see what kind of books they are. So anything in black, those are historical books. Notice the the New Testament only has one historical book, the book of Acts. Then you've got some poetry, That's kind of in a gray right above me, as well as Lamentations. Uh, No poetry in the New Testament, like no whole books of poetry. There's poetry in the books. And then there's prophecy, the the gray. Of course, that's a lot of the end of the Old Testament is prophecy, as well as a book of Revelation could be considered a prophecy as well. Uh, Gospels, of course, a unique kind of a genre, only in the New Testament. And then we end with epistles, which is a fancy word for letters. The reason we wanted to identify the kind of books these are or the genre of the books is because it's kind of like when you go to Netflix and you want to say, okay, I want a rom-com or maybe I want a Western or maybe I want a sci-fi. You know how to listen to those movies because the category they're in. A romantic comedy and a sci-fi don't typically, sometimes they do, but don't typically go together. A a, a Western and a sci-fi don't typically go together. So when you're, for example, you're watching a Western, you know how to interpret the Western because you know it's a Western. So some guy comes in a white hat, good guy, bad guy. Look, he's gonna be the good guy. That guy comes in a black hat, good guy, bad guy. It's a bad guy. And and you hear this, what's gonna happen? Somebody get shot right in the middle of the street. So you know what to expect because of the genre that it's in. The Bible's no different. Though it is God's word, it is still human language. So when you read a particular book of the Bible, you should kind of have in the back of your mind, is this poetry? For example, when you read the Psalms, you're reading poetry. It says the mountains and the hills clap their hands. Well, do mountains and hills have hands? Well, not really, but it's poetry. So, you know, it's a metaphor. When you read Revelation, it's it's not just prophecy. It's a a subcategory called apocalyptic, which is, think of it as (laughs) prophecy on drugs. Maybe there are mushrooms on Patmos. Kidding. But it's, it's wild, wild images. You know to expect that. So what I want to do is talk through, last week we talked through the Old Testament. This week I want to focus just on the New Testament. And I want to begin with this genre of Gospels. Now, when we talk about Gospels, you need to know that the Gospel is actually a political announcement. It's it's when in the Roman world, if if a general conquered an area they would make this gospel, this announcement. A, a crier would come into the center of the city and they'd go, hear ye, hear ye, the general won the war. Or if a emperor got married, they'd go, hear ye, hear ye, the emperor mar- got married. Or the emperor had a son, so that now we have a, a legacy play. The gospel is a political announcement. Now what's interesting is the first person, as far as we know, to use the term gospel was the second gospel, Mark. Mark is probably written earlier than Matthew. And I want you to hear how Mark says the gospel, how he introduces his book, the gospel. Mark chapter one, verse one. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, if you were to go back in time, and read different gospels, like of emperors and generals. This is usually about emperors and generals. You would read things like this. There was one stone, in fact, that had the gospel of Caesar Augustus that basically said, I'm paraphrasing, Caesar Augustus' birthday is coming, and he's the gift of the gods. He's the greatest emperor we've ever had, and there will never be another one greater than him. He's having a birthday, and we're so grateful that the gods gave us this god man, Caesar Augustus. Ugh. Uh, But they were all over the place, these gospels. Mark, who is writing uh, under the preaching of Peter, is like Peter's amanuensis, and he's writing in the city of Rome, opens his gospel by telling you it's the good news or the political announcement of this Messiah, of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. 
Now, if you're Jewish, the Messiah or Christ, same word in Hebrew and Greek, it makes sense to you. Mashiach is king. And we think of the Messiah as a divine figure, but it, it wasn't. It was, it was a king. It was an earthly king. Remember last week we talked about the importance of David and how David was prophesied. To, there was a new David to come, a fulfillment of David to come. That's what the Jews thought of. A mighty warrior who would destroy their enemies. Well, if you're Roman, you don't think about Messiah because that's the Jewish. You think of son of God. Who is the son of God? <laughs> There's only one. He's the emperor. Now, there were multiple emperors, but it was at this time in history that the emperors were beginning to deify themselves. And Mark, in Rome, did I say that already? In Rome, this young buck had the chutzpah to proclaim in Rome, did I say that? In Rome, he opens up his new genre by saying the good news, a political announcement that there is a new king a new Messiah. The Jews, for you Jews out there, he's Messiah. For you Romans out there, he's son of God, king of kings and Lord of lords. And this is what's so amazing about what Mark did. Most of the time when this political term gospel is used, it's in the plural. Gospels or good newses. Why? Even if it's singular. The emperor had a son. Good newses. The emperor had a son. Why is that good newses? Because there will always be another son. There will always be another war. There will always be another emperor. But Christians never used gospel in the plural. It was always in the singular because this is the last good news you will ever need to hear. So I'm gonna coach you a little bit of how to, how to read these gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are a little bit different from one another. And I wanna walk through that. But the overarching idea is when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you should read in the shadow of the cross. When you read John, you should read in the shadow of the church. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piece that apart, but let's just walk through all four to get a flavor of them. Matthew is really the most Jewish of the gospels. He has more quotations of scripture than virtually all the three combined, Jewish, which is interesting because Matthew is a tax collector and hated by the Jews. Mark, however, he's very much more Roman. And so the nature of Mark's gospel as a Roman book is, is kind of interesting for Mark. Uh, he's, he's, he uses typical Roman terminology and Roman speed. Romans were in a hurry, quite like Americans. Super interesting, if you look at the gospel of Mark, one of the most often used words is immediately. Jesus was immediately here and immediately there, like he's always in a hurry. Jesus, go in here and go in there. Jesus immediately was here and then, immediately, and then he goes back over here. Jesus is in a hurry in the first third of the book. Like boom, boom, boom. He's healing somebody. He's preaching a sermon. He's going somewhere. But then when he turns to go to Jerusalem, the, the narrative slows down. And it's like a, a walk. He's just walking to Jerusalem. Slow deliberate, slow rolling it. And then he gets to Jerusalem, he gets arrested and he's put on the cross and suddenly the time goes to slow-mo. It's a brilliant literary structure. Yes, it's the Bible. Yes, it's God's word, but it is still literature. There's other fabulous literary devices that Mark uses that I won't get into here. But just to illustrate the point, when you read the gospels, it's a story of Jesus heading to the cross with their own cultural and literary flavor on it. I mentioned that Matthew was Jewish. One of the kind of Easter eggs that Matthew gives, there's one line that's repeated five times. Here's the line. When Jesus had finished saying these things, when Jesus had finished saying these things five times, what that means is there are five sermons in the book of Matthew. Why? Why? because Matthew's Jewish. What do the Jews prize? Torah, the five books of the Old Testament. And so what Matthew is doing is saying, hey, I know that Jews have their five books, 
But the real word of God, the big five, are these sermons of Jesus. It is brilliant. It is mind-blowing. It would be offensive to the rabbis who didn't believe in Jesus, which kind of entertains me. Luke, on the other hand, I love Luke. Man, I love Luke. He is Greek. So he is a Westerner by mentality, uh, kind of like Mark, who's Roman, also Western. But for Luke, he's very much historical. And if you read the first four verses, in English, it's several sentences. In Greek, it's one single sentence. And what Luke is doing is telling you about a, a linear narrative of the story of Jesus. And the power of Luke is it's actually two volumes. It's not just the book of Luke, it's also the book of Acts. Luke and Acts are part A and part B of the same story. More on that in a minute. John is uh, spiritual or philosophical. What's interesting about John is every Bible college student that learns to read Greek, the first book they ever read is John. Why? Because his vocabulary is a sixth grade vocabulary. His thoughts are postgraduate level. I mean, John is brilliant with his sophistication and his thoughts. But he uses this simple language. Here's an example. Water. What could be more simple than water, right? <laughs> Not with John. You need to have a, a, a thesaurus in one hand and, and John in the other to really figure out what, what all the water talk is about. Chapter one, water is the water of baptism. John the Baptist baptizing people in water. John 2, Jesus turns water to wine. John 3, Nicodemus is told, you gotta be reborn of water and the spirit. John 4, woman at the well, he, she's told she could have living water. John 5, there's a lame guy at a pool of water that Jesus heals. John 6, Jesus walks on the water. John 7, rivers of living water will flow from your innermost being. Shall I go on? Water is not just H2O in John. It is this whole theological matrix for John. And that's what his whole book is, is about. And I haven't said this yet in the extended cuts. I want to say it here. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it is, it's a magical pool of water that any child could wade in and not drown. But no scholar will ever plumb the depths of you probably know me well enough to know my greatest worship is not singing songs uh, in the community. It's actually studying the word of God. And there'll be times in my office where I just, like I, I see something I've never seen before and it delights me. I can't, like I'm like, I, like a child, I can't sit down. I get up and I gotta go tell somebody and walk around the office and go, did you see this? Yeah, I'm that much of a geek. But the word of God, wherever you are in your journey, this is the beauty of it. You might think to yourself, well, I just don't know the word of God. Neither do I. I mean, this is, this is so deep and so rich that I'm lost in it. But it also, I find myself in it. And if you will get into God's word at whatever level you are, if you're in the shallow end, that's fine. You won't drown. And you can go into the depths and you will never overdiscover what God has put in here. Now, you've got these three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Their actual technical term is synoptics. Sin, meaning with, optic, meaning to see. So they're seen together. They tell a lot of the same stories. John is different. So let me, let me piece them apart. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, keep an eye on the cross because every story will take you to the cross of Jesus. That's how you read these gospels. Illustration. There was a day, actually it's one of the fullest days of Jesus' life, preach the a sermon in parables from a boat on the north side of the Lake of Galilee. Goes and heals a garrison demoniac. He comes back to Capernaum, heals a woman that had been bleeding for 12 years and a young girl who just died. Here's what's interesting. The woman had been bleeding, a gynecological problem for 12 years. And in their day, that was a, like a, that was a medical catastrophe and a social catastrophe because it made her unclean. She couldn't go to synagogue. Uh, she couldn't be intimate with her husband. She wasn't even supposed to hold her children if she had children. I mean, she was a pariah and everybody knew it because they don't have disposable sanitary products. She would have to go to the lake and clean her garments every single day for 12 years. She's emaciated and probably a little bit angry. Comes up behind Jesus and touches the edge of his garment. 
but she's interrupting a parade to Jairus' house. He's the ruler of the synagogue, big deal. Jairus' daughter, 12-year-old, only child, so they're not having another, that child had just died. And the crowd came to Jesus and said, hey, you don't need to come anymore. I know you're coming to raise her up, but she just died, she's dead. And Jesus goes, Jairus, focus, man. Follow me. She's not dead. And everybody laughed. And Jesus goes in the house and raises this little girl. Why in the world would you ever tell a story about a woman's gynecological problem? Like in the Bible, seriously. And why would you pair it with a little girl who just died? Here's why. Remember, put the cross on the horizon. And you don't read these stories individually. You read them in the shadow of the cross. What was the woman's problem? In a word, blood. And blood rendered you unclean. What was the little girl's problem? Death. And that rendered you unclean as well. Okay, so blood and death, blood and death. Two women, 12 years, blood and death. When's the next time you read blood and death in the same story? It's the cross. And what you begin to understand is what Jesus did for these two women was just an illustration. Yes, he loved them as individuals. And yes, he healed them individually. But it was bigger than their individual problems. This was a prophecy of what he would do for the world spiritually. What he did for them physically on that day. And you just go through every story of the synoptic gospels, put a cross in the background, and you will begin to see Jesus in the story more clearly. With John, it's different. And John is writing probably 40 years after the last gospel is written, maybe 25, but he's, he's writing and he's looking back at the other gospels. And though he's well aware of what they wrote, John almost never overlaps with them. He, he does with the feeding of the 5,000. That's the only time, oh, that and the resurrection. It's the only time he overlaps with the synoptic gospels. What John does is he will, he will tell a story and you think, okay, I know where he's going, I know where he's going. And then he doesn't tell you the core of the story. Case in point, John has 21 chapters, whole book. Five of those chapters take place in one room. It's the upper room, night before he dies. Five chapters. And you know what he doesn't tell you about the upper room the night before he dies? The Last Supper. It's like, are you kidding me? Like that, that was the most important thing that happened. Why did John not tell you that story in the upper room? Because he is backtracked and he tells the same story in its embryonic form at the feeding of the 5,000, where he says to the crowd, eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. See, for John, Jesus introduced the Lord's Supper long before he instituted it. He does the same thing with baptism with Nicodemus. You have to be born of water and spirit. He's introducing baptism long before baptism was instituted. He does the same thing with Pentecost, uh, John chapter five. Rivers of living water flow from you. He's introducing Pentecost long before Pentecost was instituted. What John is wanting to do is say to his church or the churches that he is leading, hey, look, I know you know the story, but do you know the genesis of the story? Do you know the beginning? Because it goes back to Jesus himself. When Jesus is living his life in a way that models the church of Jesus, it is a brilliant book. Those are the four gospels. They're the story of Jesus. And honestly, for those of you just kind of new to the Bible and you want to read a book, I would start with John. Because I don't, I don't care how much Bible you know, you're not going to plumb the depths of that book. But I don't care how little of the Bible you know, you're not going to miss who Jesus is. It's a, it's a great starting point. We go from John over to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the only historical book, but remember, it's actually the same genre as Luke. It's part A, part B. Now, what's Luke all about? Well, it's a gospel about Jesus, our hero, right? So it's kind of a historical biography of a hero. Luke is not kind of a historical biography. It is, it is a hero epic narrative. If you, if you were to be transported to the first century, and went into like the Netflix of the first century. One of the genre categories would be called acts. 
And you would say, Acts of who? Was it Acts of Caesar? Was it Acts of Paul? Was it Acts of Dionysius? Who's our hero in this story? Well, let me ask you, who is the hero of the story of Acts? You might say, was well, the Acts of the Apostles? Acts of the Apostles, yeah, no, <laughs> no. Because there's really only two apostles in the book of Acts that are highlighted. Now, they're all mentioned, but Peter and John, Peter and John. As I mentioned uh, in the message this weekend, Peter and, uh, sorry, Peter and John, Peter and Paul. As I mentioned in the message this weekend, Peter and Paul are mirror images of one another. Peter heals a lame man, chapter 3. Paul heals a lame man, chapter 14. Peter raises someone from the dead, chapter 8. Paul raises someone from the dead, uh, I think it's chapter uh, 20. But Peter uh, confronts a magician in chapter 8. Paul confronts a magician in chapter 19. So you got all these parallels, Peter, Paul, Peter, Paul, Peter, Paul. But Peter and Paul are not the heroes. They are examples of people who live out the life of Jesus. Because every time you say Peter, Paul, Peter, Paul, you could also go back a step into the Gospels and say Jesus, Peter, Paul, Jesus, Peter, Paul. And the point is not Jesus, Peter, Paul. It is Jesus, Peter, Paul, and you. Because if Paul, a murderer of Christians, can do what Jesus did, and if Peter, who denied Jesus, could do what Jesus did, then so can you. I love the structure of Acts. And as we talked about over the weekend, the ending of Acts leads you to believe there's more to the story. And listen, Acts, I love this, is the only book of the Bible that you get to finish. And you finish it by allowing the hero of the story to live through you. You go, who's the hero? Jesus, yeah? No, it's not Jesus. Jesus is gone. Jesus, the hero of Luke. So who is the hero of Acts? It is none other than the Holy Spirit of God. Because what Jesus began to do, this is Luke's verbiage in Acts 1.1, what Jesus began to do, the Holy Spirit takes over and completes. And Jesus right now at the right hand of the Father is advocating for you, but it is the Spirit of God who is really incarnate in our world through the church of Jesus Christ. And as you look at the book of Acts, one of the ways to evaluate any, like if you're going to do literary analysis and say, okay, what's important to this author? What, what, what's really uh, kind of, what's their, what's their stick? What's their jam? Whether that is a mystery novel, you know, certain uh, mystery authors have certain stories they tell or romance novels. My wife loves those things. But they have certain romance novels have kind of the stories they tell. What is the story that Luke tells? Well, you know he's a physician, so he is interested in people's physical care. He's also highly intellectual, so he is interested in like deep vocabulary. I, I told you John is the easiest book to read in Greek. You know what the hardest is? It's Acts. Hebrews is right up there, but Acts 17, man, whew, that's some hard, hard stuff, super intellectual. And yet you have this highly intellectual medical doctor who is also socially engaged. And the number one thing on Luke's heart is actually inclusion. They call them Gentiles. You could put any name in there of, of women or ethnic minorities or people who are uh, from another country, immigrants. Luke is concerned about people who have been overlooked and forgotten. And in fact, there's only two stories in Luke. I'm sorry, in the book of Acts, there's only two stories that Luke repeats, and he repeats them both three times. It is the story of Saul's conversion, Saul to Paul, and it's the story of Peter baptizing the first Gentile. He repeats the story of Paul, his conversion, because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, the outsiders. And he tells the story of Peter converting Cornelius because he was the first non-Jewish person to ever get baptized into Christ. Luke, if you are an outsider, and all of us who are not Jewish are outsiders to this kingdom of God, if you're an outsider, man, this is a book that you will love digging into. If you are interested in knowing how to do church, or well, not the mechanics of what songs to sing or how many campuses to have or who should be pastor, but how should we represent Jesus in this world as the church? This is a book for you. 
After reading the book of John, I would suggest for those wanting to do any kind of leadership in the church, this book is an absolute must. So we move from Gospels, then to the book of Acts, on to some of these, they call them epistles, which it's a fancy word for letter. Uh, we've got a, a number of them. Most of them are written by Paul. In fact, all these Romans through Philemon were all written by the Apostle Paul. Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. Some think that was Paul. Uh, then you've got James. You know who wrote that? <laughs> yeah, James. And Peter and John and Jude, Jesus' half-brother. All of those letters, what I love about these letters is that they're written to real people in real places. In fact, I, I've, I've, I've looking at all these uh, the letters. I've been to Rome. I can tell you, Rome is a real place. I, I love the city of Rome. Not the best food, but man, the architecture. Uh, uh, Corinth is an ancient archaeological site. You can go there today. Uh, Galatia is a region, not a not a simple city. Ephesus, greatest archaeological site in the world, in my estimation. Uh, Philippians, oh, it's a lovely little place on the river. I, I, in other words, I've been to all these places. Colossians is the only where Colossae is the only city I've not been to. Uh, someday, but they haven't done any archaeology in it, so why would I waste my time until they do some digging? And listen, I've done archaeology before, like for one afternoon. That's all I've ever done. Like uh, literally, uh, an official dig. I was on it for one afternoon, and I will never do it again. <laughs> it's like. And not because it's not important, it's just I would rather let someone else do the hard work and then I'll just uh, show it in a sermon. Okay, you're welcome. These places are real places. I love knowing that these are real people, even though their names are a little bit different, but it's the same struggles that we're having today. And you might not have visited those cities. That's okay, you don't have to. But you've, you live in this city. And the same things that are going on in this city are going on in the ancient city. So again, the most important thing of reading through the epistles is to find principles that you can apply across culture. So when, you're, when you are interpreting the Bible, the two greatest difficulties of interpreting the Bible or understanding the Bible is literal versus figurative. Like how much do we take literally when Jesus says, eat my body and drink my blood? Well, obviously you're not gonna take that literally. But there's other things. Um, how much is literal? How much is figurative? That's a big issue when you're talking about revelation. And the second one is a cultural versus universal. Paul told women to wear head coverings. Totally normal in their culture. Kind of weird in ours. Should we still be doing that? Nah, I'm going to say no on that one. But uh, what about washing feet? Totally normal in their culture. Not in ours. So what do we do with that? Uh, baptism. I think is, is an action that though it was Jewish in orientation is a universal in application. And there's a number of reasons for that, but that, that's one of the questions. The other question though is uh, with cultural universal, what, what are we going to, how are we going to apply the statements of these letters to people of a different place at another time? I'm not going to say, like, my purpose here is not to answer every question. My, I'm just raising the question so that you go, so you understand. Sometimes you're going to read and go, should I apply that or should I not? If you don't know, then don't highlight that verse for application. I'm going to be very specific here. When you're reading the Bible, what I would suggest, especially as a starter kit, read one chapter a day and pick one verse from that chapter that you're going to apply for one hour. You go, why not the whole day? Because you can't. Well, I mean, trust me, it's just too, that take one hour to go, I'm gonna perfectly obey this verse for one hour. That's enough to challenge you to grow. So don't pick a verse that you're confused about. And we'll talk actually in our next session about how to answer some of those questions yourself. But for right now, just say, if it's a question, put it off to the side, read one chapter, find one verse, and apply it for one hour four days a week, and you will be like skyrocketing in your faith. I want to show you one example of that, of how that actually works. I'm going to take you to the book of uh, Philippians, that beautiful little, uh, wasn't even a synagogue or a church. It was just a group of people down by a river. Paul met them in Acts chapter 16. Later, he writes this letter of Philippians to them. Chapter four begins 
with, um, it's a statement that Paul makes to two women, Euodia and Syntyche, and he's telling them to get along. <laughs> Imagine that. This church was mostly a female church, and there were two women who were kind of at odds with one another. I know nothing like that ever happens in your sphere, but there you go. In the, in the context of that conversation, Paul says, remember, two, two people fighting. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he repeats it. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, when your mother repeats something, it's probably important for you to obey, right? So Paul is actually writing this from prison to a church where you have two women who are at odds. Is that where you normally rejoice? No, but he's, so he's telling you rejoice. Now, how would you apply that to your life? I bet you right now as you're watching this, there's something that you're finding difficult to rejoice in. It's not that you need to rejoice in that, but can you rejoice now even though you have this trial going on? Paul says, not once, twice, yes, rejoice. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. And this, this is a big one, verse six. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So we know, and this is not getting better, it's getting worse, people are triggered, people are anxious. And, and you know the whole litany of reasons why we're anxious. How are you doing with your anxiety? Now, I don't want to minimize it, and if you need professional help, by all means, get professional help. But what if what, if what you need is not professional help, but spiritual guidance? How would you apply this statement, be anxious for nothing? Could you do that for one hour? To, to, not, to not be anxious for one hour? The answer is no. Not unless you replace anxiety with something else. What is the something else that could crowd out your anxiety? There are not one, not two, but five options given in this passage alone. I want to unpack that for you. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. What if when you're feeling anxious, you're going you're to not be anxious for an hour. So what are you going to do for that hour? Well, you're going to rejoice. You're going to make a list of all the things that you're happy about. Pray through them with God or sing a song of praise to God, but spend some time rejoicing. Okay, that's just one of five. So that would be, you know, if you're gonna do this for an hour, that's 12 minutes. You, can you rejoice for 12 minutes? Can you make a list of happy things for 12 minutes? Uh, then second thing is by prayer and petition. So instead of worrying about what's bothering you, just talk, to God, talk it through with God. Like strategize with God. What do you want me to do about it? How do you want me to approach it? Now, I'll be transparent with you. I, I, I'm actually working through this today. Uh, I have a conversation that's coming up that's going to be a difficult one. And so instead of thinking about, okay, I'm going to say this and they're going to say that and we're going to, like, I'm going to win the, win the debate, I just started praying to God about it and asking, okay, how would, what do you want me to learn from this? How do you want me to posture myself in this? Man, it made a difference because when you're strategizing how to obey God, it's really difficult to be anxious for how the outcome is gonna fit for you. And then with thanksgiving, again, make a list of all the things that you're thankful for. Uh, rejoicing is different. Rejoicing is what you're happy about. Thankful is what you're thankful for. Maybe some overlap, but a different category. There's another 12 minutes. And the peace of God will guard your hearts. And then this, finally, brothers, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. And then here's the fifth one. Whatever you have heard or received or heard or whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul was a model. He's in prison writing this. Look, when someone in prison tells you to rejoice, you got to rejoice. When someone in prison tells you don't be anxious, you got to give up anxiety, right? So there are models in our lives. If you want to reduce anxiety, again, this is just one example of applying a verse. 
The verse is, be anxious for nothing. Okay, how? How am I gonna apply that for one hour? I'm, gonna, I'm going to rejoice. I'll sing songs of praise to God. I'm going to pray it through with God, specifically thanksgiving, making a list of all the things that I'm thankful for. I, I'm going to then uh, look at the models in my life who have gone before me and manage their life in such a way that they could not be anxious, even though they had more reason than I to be anxious. You do those five things for one hour, you will successfully apply this passage. How about that? Now, what, what I just did, I've been doing this for a long time. It, 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 the process has become more natural for me. If you struggle with it at first, that's fine. Walk before you run. But what I just did, any one of you could do. You might come up with a different list or some different practices, but you can apply what's in the epistles to your life. And that leaves just one book of the Bible. And man, is it a doozy. And obviously, I'm not going to unpack the book of, of Revelation, but it is uh, curious. A lot of people are super curious about this book. A lot of people are uh, predicting the end of the world uh, by this book. Here is my overall view of Revelation. I've studied every verse. I have done deep dives on the prophetic literature, so I'm not afraid of it. Here's just what I know. I was asked to teach the book of Revelation at a church once, a little church up in Kansas. And so I decided instead of reading commentaries, other people's opinion about the book, I'm just going to read the book. And for 30 days, I read the book every day for 30 days. And I just made a list of questions like, what does that mean? What is that? And who is that? And when is that? And as I read the book the next day, some of the questions I had, oh, oh well, here's the answer in the book. And the third day, oh, here's another answer. By the end of the 30 days, I had five questions. There were five verses that I could not pin down. I just, I didn't know what they meant. So I pulled off five commentaries from my shelf and I read five commentaries on each of the five passages and I came up with 25 explanations. In other words, nobody knows any better than I do from just reading the book. And probably you as well. And my concern with the way Revelation is often used as a, as a calendar of future events, so far, everyone who has prognosticated a specific end date of Revelation has been wrong. I don't like to be wrong, and so I'm not going to get into that game. So I thought, what if we changed our approach to Revelation, and instead of using it as a calendar for the future, we use it as a template for the present. And I preached, I preached the message through Revelation of this church in Kansas, and people were actually healed. Marriages were healed. Emotions were healed. People were comforted. So I'm going to tell you just a, a, a slim overview of the first message. The book of Revelation has three images of Jesus. Chapter 1, chapter 5, chapter 19. 1, 5, 19. Each of them are different, and each of them are wild. The, the first one is Jesus as the great high priest. He's standing in priestly robes. He has the hair of God and eyes of fire, and, and it is, he is like this wow figure. After chapter one, there's letters to seven churches. And the seven churches were primarily struggling with the same sins that we're struggling with because they had lost vision of the great high priest. And they were looking to themselves and not to Jesus. And when they took their eyes off the great high priest, their behavior suffered for it. The solution to every problem in this church and every other church I know, the solution to every problem is to keep your eyes on Jesus, the great high priest. Because if your eyes are on him, you cannot fight with the brother. Well, the second image of Jesus in Revelation is chapter five. John has a scroll, it's given to him, written front and back on the scroll, and he can't read it. He doesn't have the authority to open it. And he, he, he so wants to know what's in the scroll. He begins to weep. And the angel says, John, don't weep, don't weep. Though you can't open the scroll, there is one who can open the scroll. Hey, you who can open the scroll, come on out. Ollie, ollie, oxen free. It's the, it's, the, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And out walks, not a lion, but a lamb. And not just any old lamb, a slain lamb. He was pathetic. He was bloodied. He was beaten. And you begin to realize that the lion and the lamb are one and the same. 
He conquered by suffering for us. You know what happens after that vision, chapter five? That's chapter six through 19. It's the, the tribulation period. That's where everyone gets spooked and the trials and tribulations and all the wrath of God. And what Revelation is telling you is, look, if you keep your eyes on the lamb, it doesn't matter what suffering you go through. If your eyes are on the lamb, you will realize he has already suffered for you and more than you. And as the lion who has already suffered as a lamb, he can take you through whatever suffering in this world you go through. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Chapter 19, whew, man, this is a, wow. He comes on a white horse. When Jesus came the first time, he was, he, he was carrying a shepherd's staff. He, he's got no shepherd's staff. He's got a sword. And it's not in his hand. It's coming straight out his mouth. And the first time he came, he wore a, a peasant's garment. Not this time. It's robes dipped in blood. The first time he wore a crown of thorns. This time it's a crown of jewels. And he's not alone in a garden. He's got an army of angels behind him. He is coming with the wrath of God against all the enemies of kings of the earth lined up against him. And it's what is called the battle of Armageddon. What a crock. There's no battle of Armageddon. It is a slaughter of Armageddon. Without a bow, without a shot, without any aggression, Jesus speaks and they lay down and die. Jesus, the king of kings, coming again. You know what comes after that? Judgment day. This uncertain future of how is it all going to end? If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you will understand you have nothing to worry about tomorrow because when he comes, the king of kings will write it all. Revelation is not about predicting the future. It's about surviving in the present. And when we approach scriptures, the word of God as a template for living our lives, we arm ourselves for any uncertainties of the future or difficulties of the present or sin of the past. That's why I so hope these sessions are helpful to you. You're not gonna understand everything you read, but if you read and your heart is, is on the table and this is the scalpel, not the other way around, this is not on the table and you're not the scalpel. If you put yourself on the table and this is the scalpel, you will be healed. May God make it so. Thank you all.